Welcome to this today's seminar requested by the International Environmental Institute at ALP. My name is Valentina Contrera and I'm a research officer at the IAI. And I'm incredibly pleased today to be sharing this seminar titled the Environmental Opportunity and Investment Process, uh, which is part of the IAI Inequality Seminar Series. And the speaker is Dr. Michelle Brock. Uh, Michelle is a senior research economist at the European Bank for Constructive Development. Uh, may, I ask you, may I ask our online audience to please keep yourself muted. As usual, there will be a chance for you to post questions to the speaker following the presentation, and we will take questions from both the in-person and the online audience. Um, I will now hand over to Michelle. Uh, many thanks all, and enjoy the event. Thank you so much, Valentina. Thanks everyone for coming today. It is uh, a great pleasure for me to be here presenting, especially to this audience, on a topic that I think a lot of us have thought a lot about, inequality of opportunity. Um, this work is joint with Maurizio Busolo at the World Bank. And um, I'm obligated to remind everyone that the opinions expressed in the work is, does not necessarily reflect the opinions of my institution or the World Bank. A uh, typical outline for the presentation. For the uninitiated, I will define IOP. Um, fairly, for the initiated, it's going to be a fairly cursory definition. Uh, then move into motivation uh, experimental design. This is, this is a laboratory experiment. And then we'll talk about the results. So what is inequality of opportunity? Various disciplines have taken various approaches to think about this topic. And researchers in economics also kind of uh, take different approaches. You know, some people take a very broad view. Uh, but in, in this audience and in the work that I do, I think about inequality of opportunity as the portion of inequality that can be attributable to circumstances over which we have no control. So this comes from literature that was developing in the 90s where they put forward a, a few different paradigms for how to think about where income inequality overall comes from. And the one that we're going to refer to in this seminar in this paper is the choices and circumstances paradigm. So we think about the income you get as a reflection of the choices you make, whether it be which profession to enter, how many hours to work, uh, and then the things that act upon you that you have to respond to that you, you can't change. So um, COVID hits, right? And your, your uh, country does, or your city does, higher lockdowns than other cities. So it changes your career trajectory in a different way than here, who might have the exact same choices as you, but been experienced, uh, exposed to different levels of lockdown. Another common example is the gender, or the sex with which we're born, or lives the first few years of our lives. The women experience different outcomes for the same choices than men. And there's, there's a tremendous amount of research on this. But we're thinking in this paper about inequality of opportunity um, in terms of this construct. I also include here a bullet point in terms of the measurement um, that can be attributed to Bourguignon, who put forth this um, approach to measuring inequality of opportunity parametrically. The reason I like this is because it is um, it really helps us to think about how we might implement inequality of opportunity in the lab. So in this equation here, YIK is your income, C are the circumstances that you're exposed to, and E are your choices or your efforts. So either of these can change your outcome in some uh, predictable way, and notably, your effort can also be a function of your circumstances. Okay, and then if you put this through um, some, some calculations and you apply some inequality distributions, you can then decompose this very nicely into the portion of inequality due to circumstances and the portion due to choices. So when I'm going through this, I'm not actually gonna be talking about um, this process of effort to income. I'm actually gonna be thinking about once you have this, having been exposed to inequality of opportunity, what's your next choice, okay? So if you will, this in a dynamic setting or this in the second round. So why then would we wanna think about investment as a choice that might be a function of inequality of opportunity? Why is this important to ask? 
Well, we know that investing in physical, financial, and human capital is important for income, wealth growth among households and small businesses. We also know that the propensity to make risky investments may depend on exogenous factors, experiences to which you have uh, been exposed. So some examples of this, so um, the, it, in socioeconomic uh, characteristics have been shown to be correlated with less uh, financial investments and people who are, were impacted from losses um, from like the Great Depression or other economic downturns have um, less in uh, financial risk taking subsequently. Uh, bringing these things together, we can think about IOP's impact on investment as a potential channel through which inequality of opportunity impacts growth. As I mentioned, this study is a laboratory experiment. And uh, one thing I'm going to emphasize a few times is that we are holding access to the investment opportunity constant. This is important because in real life, people who are exposed to or who kind of fall on the upside or downside of an inequality of opportunity process are actually going to have different investment opportunities because they have different profiles and backgrounds. That makes it really hard to use real world, real world data to study this question. So in the lab, we can hold this constant. The outcome of interest is going to be the last choice participants make after a series of, of, um, of tasks. Uh, is going to be a standard and easy putters investment choice where you put money in and you either lose it all or with some probability you get a huge payout. We see this as a stylized version of a choice to allocate savings to an activity that may or may not yield returns in real life. So some examples include a firm considering whether to invest in its capital stock or to expand its production activity. You you buy that extra machine, your capital is gone, it's invested in there, you may, you may not get any return out of that, uh, or you may get lots. Or a household considering whether they want to invest in their child's education, which is technically a risky investment, or take the money, put it in the safe place, squirrel it away for retirement or savings. So those are the types of settings we think our experiment can, can generalize to. Now, <clears throat> how do we expect inequality of opportunity to impact investment. I'm gonna talk about canonical model and then some less canonical thinking that's more rooted in behavioral economics and sociology. So the canonical model would tell us that inequality of opportunity is going to reduce investment overall. This is because the decision to take a financial risk is going to be a function of the expected returns and the individual's risk aversion. Now, in, in real life, risk return trade-offs may actually be quite different between groups. Uh, people in excluded, excluded groups may also have less risk tolerance due to their previous negative shocks or experiences. You also might have different expected uh, outcomes, with what I refer to as subjective expected returns. So people who experience a low income due to circumstances beyond their control may form pessimistic beliefs about the possible outcomes of investment. So IOP could actually also increase investments. And this is through a phenomena called consumption externalities, also known as keeping up with the Joneses. So I put money into something because some, my, my next door neighbor did, and I can't fall behind their level of wealth or status or whatever it is I'm comparing to. This is a very kind of innate thing. It's been documented um, extensively. Humans do this. Uh, in our setting, we started to think about this as a potentially important uh, mechanism behind the relationship between inequality of opportunity and investment because we know first that people exhibit preferences over how fair and income generating processes are. They also, uh, as I said, there's plenty of papers that show us that when you find yourself in the lower rank position, it, you tend, not you, well, subjects tend to take more risk. And this is interpreted as a catching up process. I'm throwing more money out there because I've fallen behind and what do I have to lose? That the value of gaining status or of becoming closer to your peers is worth that risk. Um, right, so the quintessential example or one of the most powerful ones in the literature 
it to me is that of investment bankers who take more risk with, and this is real life data, they're taking more risk when they fear they're falling behind their peers. It's a really nice paper that demonstrates consumption externalities in uh, the context of income inequality. So not IOP, but income inequality and investment. So we're gonna take these uh, to, the, to the lab. We're gonna try and answer two questions. One, what is the marginal impact of inequality of opportunity on individual investment in a risky asset? And two, how does earnings rank interact with the source of inequality in the income generating culture? Our contribution fits into the empirical literature on circumstances and investment. So as I uh, alluded to, there is literature that looks at investment and uh, being a disadvantaged group. There is literature looking at um, and experimental literature on inequality, income inequality, and how people respond in investment. But there's nobody who's, looking, who's looked at inequality of opportunity, the part of inequality that is due to forces outside of your control. So we're essentially asking, does adding inequality of opportunity to the story change that relationship? And as I mentioned, importantly, we're holding access to investment and interest rates equal in the lab. Um, and allows us to isolate IOP from experience. I'm gonna walk, I'm gonna show you a, two tables on the experimental design, and then I'm gonna walk you through the tasks and uh, people did and the questions they answered. So the card of the experiment is this um, comparison between a group whose inequality of their income comes only from their efforts. So they're gonna do a real effort task and there will be uh, inequality of income. And then there's a group that has their income due both to effort and also something outside of their control. So this is what I'm talking about. We're identifying the marginal effect of inequality of opportunity because both uh, income distributions in both groups have display inequality after the task, right? So we're wanting to know what if that income is also subject to circumstance effects. The circumstance we're gonna use is the zip code where people spent the first 12 years of their life. We are using a technique, borrowing the technique from Durante et al. And uh, what happens is you gather the zip code information and then you randomize the zip code into whether they're gonna get a high pay rate or a low pay rate. So you know that everyone who shares your zip code is sharing that same pay rate. It is something that's innate to you and meaningful to you. So in some sense, we are trying to bring some external validity into the lab. But instead of your zip code representing maybe the actual privileged place it represents, you might be randomized that your zip code is a low paying zip code. They don't know that. I mean, do they know if their zip code is a high paying or low paying one? Yes. So we're very explicit about that and I'll get to that. Um, so I think uh, just quickly, what we could have done is just randomly allocated wages to people, but we didn't think that that was going to really get at this issue of effort plus circumstances, because um, we are immersed in this literature, you know, this Romer literature, where not only uh, do you have this random circumstances acting on your ability to make money, but luck also. And, and pure luck is separated out from that. So in the lab, we felt that if we simply said, oh, you randomly get high and you randomly get low, that we're not actually showing an inequality of opportunity effect, but rather how people respond to pure luck. Oops. Right, okay. So uh, that brings me to the next slide on our control group. So one thing to note is that um, the control group has uniform wages. This is how we get a fair or an effort-based inequality, income inequality distribution. The inequality of opportunity group, they're gonna have two different wages in that group, okay? There is no other way to replicate inequality of opportunity effect on people's earning potential uh, that is so straightforward without ending up with wage inequality, okay? I'm sure there's other things you could do, but we're looking for clarity uh, for subjects. The control group could have been different. So we could have had a wage differential in the control group 
where we base it on random luck. Okay, so this is the alternative I talked about why we didn't choose that for inequality of opportunity treatment. We could have used it for the control group. But again, we really wanted to stay real near the theory on this. So if we were comparing a control group where there was wage inequality based on luck to a treatment group where there was uh, wage inequality based on inequality of opportunity, I'm not getting the marginal additional impact of inequality of opportunity. Uh, I'm getting an inequality of opportunity versus luck effect. So we decided not to do that. We could have added uh, wage inequality in the control group by rewarding some people a higher uh, wage based on their performance in some way. The challenge with this is that you need a common value set of what is fair to measure for performance and uh, uniform beliefs that people should get rewarded that way, okay? One of our objectives with this project is potentially take it to other uh, settings. So we didn't want to start with a situation where we already were kind of tying our hands on needing people to all believe the same thing about meritocracy and performance compensation. Okay. So then the, the other part of the experiment is where we look at this consumption externalities effect. We cross randomize people knowing the rank they, uh, they occupy in the income distribution. So now I'm going to walk you through the experiment and then, um, yeah, ask questions about exactly how we operationalize this as we go. The first part of the experiment is a real effort task round. Everyone does the same thing in this round. We needed to generate a distribution of income inequality. So people did a ball catching task and we were looking for a task where, people, where we could have equal wages and as much as possible equal costs of effort. Oops, wrong direction. So we took this um, ball catching task from Goucher et al. In this task, the subject's objective is to catch these little yellow balls that are hanging at the top of the screen. They're gonna drop down in a random order and you wanna catch them in this green bucket, right? And, and so it's basically a video game. You can move that bucket across the screen by clicking these left and right buttons. Each click costs 10 tokens, and in this first round, each catch earned you 20 tokens. As you go through the exercise, you are uh, made aware of your catches, your clicks, and how this translates to your score and what you spent on pressing these left and right. We did three warm-up rounds to make sure people really understood how to do the task. We also asked cognitive questions about what is, what is this catches, what, is, what do you get every time you catch it? What is your expense if you catch this many times and click this many times? So we made sure people understood the trade-offs involved. We also didn't want to any feelings of unfairness to arise because of people knowing they may be better or worse at this task kind of inherently. So we told people, look, to move this green thing across the screen, it's um, four clicks. If you can, you can leave it there. Never click anything and see how many balls you catch. Uh, you, you can do it, you can leave it in the middle and just click one way. We gave them all the different strategies because we wanted people to really do their best at this game and feel like it was a fair um, playing field. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, after they did this task, we told them the distribution of clicks that everybody did. So they knew the effort distribution. They knew their own catches and their own place in the distribution. And we asked them, okay, based on this information, tell us where you think you rank uh, in the income distribution. Uh, this was the exact uh, wordings. So we uh, decided to stay away from percentile wording or 10 step ladder wording because we were worried about uh, people really engaging with this part of the exercise. There's a huge bias in these types of ranking um, uh, questions for people to put themselves in the middle. We wanted to try and eliminate that as much as possible. So we talked about how many people are below you at each point in this, um, in this line. So this is, you can think of these as the deciles of the income distribution. If you're one, you're at the top, you're the number one. 
and then this is the people at the lowest and P the participants as they move the the slider across this number would change so um we we didn't know if they could calculate percentiles frankly so um this number was an active parameter depending on how many people showed up in the lab to do the task after how many each show up so um around 20 to 25 per session we didn't run the sessions without at least 20 and then our lab manager was very efficient so he kind of he didn't want giant sessions because the room wasn't that big and but it was about 20. Hey, one, one question yeah so in this setting the clicks is a proxy for the effort that people yes making. yes okay after that, we asked a few demographic questions. These would often appear in surveys at the end of an experiment, but we needed that zip code information, so we added a few at this stage. Then we explicitly ended that round. The next round is what we call the investment task round, and this is where we are um, applying our two different treatments. So uh, we apply this IOP to the wages, and we apply them to the catches from the previous task. So we did not want subjects doing a new task where the effort that they chose might be a function of whether they were randomized to the high or the low wage uh, group, or a function of the fact that they have differential wages in their group as opposed to the control group where all the wages were uniform. So we said, you're gonna have, you need money for the next task. We're going to pay you based on the effort you did in that, in that ball catching task and uh, there's gonna be new wages. So actually, but, um, everyone had a little raise, if you will, uh, in this second uh, calculation of earnings. The control group, their earnings went up to 22 per ball caught. And in the inequality of opportunity group, uh, the high earners got 27 per ball caught and the low earners got 22. We explicitly framed this because we didn't want to be, at the end of the day, challenging ourselves or questioning ourselves, what are we actually observing? So because we wanted to observe how people respond to the fact that their zip code could determine their payments, we told them, in life, sometimes things outside of your control impact your income. For example, research has shown that the place where you were born can play a role in determining your life trajectory. Rates of earning tokens to start off this round will depend on the zip code where you lived as a child. And there are two pay rates. So now the people who saw this were the ones that were randomized into the inequality of opportunity group. The control group did not see this message. Um, the inequality of opportunity group knew that there was a high and a low wage group and they knew what the high and the low wage group payouts would be. Everyone knew that information and we also uh, were very explicit that the zip code is what is randomized to the lower pay or higher pay group. So it would, this would have been the message someone had seen if they were randomized into this group. And then we remind them that cost per click does not change and is the same for everyone. And uh, we give them another rank perception elicitation. Given these new information on their wages, what do you, where do you think you stand in the rank distribution? distribution now. The next step is to randomize receipt of rank information. So following the rank elicitation, half of the people in each of the con uh, control and treatment group are told whether they uh, were correct about their rank guess. So you could have received one of three messages telling you that there are more people lower than you, you got it right, or there are um, fewer people lower than you. And we then use the same uh, image to show them where they were actually positioned on this uh, horizontal bar. And then finally, the very the, the one choice we're really interested in here is the in investment task. We uh, replicate the Nizi plotters so that we have some basis to compare it with in the literature rather than coming up with a novel investment choice. Um, so if they lost, which was the most likely outcome, they would lose their entire uh, chunk invested. And if they won, they would get 2.5 times the amount invested. 
we did these experiments from February 2020 to July 2021. Um, we had 499 subjects and the COVID lockdowns happened right in the middle of our session. So we moved online, which um, worked surprisingly well. So it took, we used this thing called node gain. Okay, I don't know if you guys already have ways to do experiments online. Um, converting it to online was a task, but once we got it up there, the, the, if I interact this online dummy with my results, I don't see any difference in behavior. We were able to also group people, um, convince people that they were uh, part of a group. Um, this was important. So we, we said, okay, other people have done this task recently. You're gonna be in that group and your income uh, and your position, it's all gonna be relative to this group and it will not change as you move through the task. So we use this kind of framing. Well, I mean, that's exactly what we did also behind the scenes. Uh, the experiment was hosted at my alma mater, the University of Maryland Ag Econ Department. Subjects earned tokens, which were converted to US dollars in the ratio of 50 tokens to $1. Any questions before I move to results? Yeah. Were the subjects students at the University of Maryland? Yes, they were. Okay. So the first result, I have two main outcome variables I'm interested in. One is the probability that you invest some non-zero amount of money, and the other is the amount you invest. So the two charts is, is the heart of the results. Each chart has two uh, groupings of three bars. This one here on your left is the group that did not receive any rank information. So these people do not know where they rank in the income distribution. These people do. The blue will always refer to the no IOP. So this is where the inequality distribution as a result of the catches they made and nothing else. The red is people who were subject to inequality of opportunity and got the lower pay rate. And the green are the people subject to inequality of opportunity and got the higher pay rate. What we see in this chart is that <clears throat> first, if you look on this side with no feedback, the folks in the inequality of opportunity treatment do not appear to be more or less likely to invest compared to the control. If you look in the feedback treatment, uh, it's a similar story. The pattern is a little different here. This is not statistically significant, but um, you're gonna see something like this in the next slide that's gonna really pop out. So we're gonna talk about this briefly. What it looks like is that when you get feedback about your place of income distribution, in the presence of inequality of opportunity, those people who are in the low rank are maybe more likely to take a risk. This is a very small effect, but um, it's a distinctively different pattern than when you have no feedback. And when we look at the amount invested, we really see that um, in space. So again, on the left, these people do not know their place in the income distribution. Uh, the inequality of opportunity and control look the same. And on the right, where we have uh, people knowing their spot in the distribution, the folks who are randomized to low wages in the inequality of opportunity group invest more, a higher portion of their total uh, tokens, their total earnings. The, uh, the high group is down here in the green. Now these are very, uh, this, if you do a t-test here, the, the probability, uh, or sorry, the, the significance value is less than 0 0.001. This standard error here in the control group is quite large, so you do have overlap with both those groups, but the pattern is um, undeniable. We wanted to understand what was going on or be, show a little more um, evidence in favor of this consumption externality or, or opposed to this consumption externality uh, argument. Uh, so what we did was we interacted the actual rank with the treatment to see if the low rank people are um, necessarily um, less likely to invest in a regression framework. And then we do see that's the case. So this first column is the entire sample. And you see that the investment is higher in the IOP treatment on average. 
And as uh, pre-investment earning rank goes up, so you get higher or, you know, so in this, the higher rank means you're better off, uh, that investment proportion goes down. Without feedback, that effect is absent, though you do see the right signs. Uh, and then again, so it's all driven by this group with rank feedback getting IOP uh, as well. Now we did this regression with perceived rank. So I asked, and I did rank perception elicitation um, and that doesn't actually have an effect. Now, the signs are going in the same direction, but it's, I find this really interesting because what it tells me is that people take rank perceptions. Well, I, I asked them to, I say, tell me where you think you are. But the folks who are not told if that's correct or not, don't actually appear to really use that information in their decision making. Once I confirm for you where you sit in that distribution, then it becomes important. We can think of real life as kind of a halfway point between these two with and without feedback, uh, rank feedback scenarios. We all kind of know where we sit. We perceive there's a lot of perception going on. It's based on your reference group. So I might think I sit lower in the distribution than I actually do simply because my neighbors are more wealthy than me. But I forget that people, you know, five minutes away might not be as wealthy as I am. So there's perception issues, right? We, we don't necessarily know all the time where we sit in the rank, but we also have a lot of information that we're consuming on a daily basis that does help us have some kind of informed perception. So while, um, while I can't tell you that real life is one of these or the other of these, I think it's in between. We did a little exercise to understand the size of the effect depending on where you are ranked. And this, is, this gives us also a sense of how big these effects are relative to the literature. So um, the literature, as I mentioned, is on income inequality overall, not inequality of opportunity. They find a similar uh, effect. And the size of the effect is actually quite similar for the people in the lowest rank. So people in the lowest rank are giving nine percentage uh, points more of their, of their pot of money to the investment than uh, the control group. Folks who are ranked at the uh, sixth spot here, uh, they're, they're about the same. And then the, you see that negative effect start to pop up. So the people in the highest rank are actually less likely to invest. Uh, than the control, or invest less of their money than the control. The result summary is quite straightforward. So we conclude that IOP itself is unimportant for investment choices when income rank is unknown, but it does impact investment when income rank is known. In particular, receiving this information spurs people in the low wage group to take more risk than the comparison groups and we interpret this as a catching up effect, not a reflection of difference in risk attitudes or pessimistic beliefs. We think more research is needed to determine how this all comes out when the people do face different opportunities. Uh, so what's the combined effect say from being at the bottom of the distribution, basically knowing it and seeing your opportunities are different. Does that entire picture look different um, than, than what we have here? Policy implications are mostly in favor of things that are already going on. So um, it concerns me if people at the bottom feel compelled to take extra risk in the sense that I worry their opportunities are maybe not as good. So there's a few things we wanna do. We wanna, to some extent, help the people at the bottom, you know, find their way up that ladder over time we continue to invest in things like education and healthcare. Those are all good inequality of opportunity or all good policies for addressing inequality of opportunity and making rank uh, issue less salient. We also think that financial literacy is really important in this case to help protect against excessive risk taking. And then uh, we argue for improved access to prudent investment opportunities. So these people want to improve their lives. They're willing to take some risks to do it. We, we think it's great when business people do it, uh, when rich people do it. We need to also support people who maybe are not classic investment types, 
to have good opportunities, solid opportunities to make good bets in their own benefit and, the, and their children's benefit. So some examples include um, federally backed credit guarantees for small business loans or consumer loans. So this is where instead of asking the person to put up collateral, which many people don't have, the government acts as the guarantor for the loan. You can also do things like subsidizing or continue to subsidize or offer free tertiary education uh, to facilitate human capital development. That concludes my presentation and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. I'm going to open the floor for questions uh, from the audience here first, uh, but also we will be taking um, questions from the online audience. So people online, you can raise your hands if you have a question, I mean, the hand icon, or you can type your questions in the comment section. But let's start with the room. Hey, hi, so super interesting and yeah, it was quite cool to see the experiment and, and all of that. Um, I have a few questions and a few comments. So when, when you talk about the, the clicks being like a, a proxy for, for effort, um, how, how do you account, for example, for people that are a bit more agile with their hands and to play with, with that kind of stuff? That's the first thing. And the second thing is when, when you do that, how at the beginning you talk about this effort being conditional on circumstances or a function of circumstances of potentially being a function of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that you could look at it in the experiment? Because if, if you have the data of individuals and how they change the way they click each time, you could try to do a kind of a fixed effect to see how they change their clicks after knowing where the standard distribution. And then you kind of know the relationship between that effort or that proxy of effort and circumstances. So, <clears throat> okay, so we have tried to give the opportunity to make effort where circumstances would not be salient. Uh, they only did that effort choice one time, right? So I'm not, I don't understand the second suggestion um, because it sounded like it would be like the next time they do clicks, then I would be able to do a fixed effect. But I, I only have one. Um, well, they each did three rounds, but I didn't intervene with information uh, in that effort process. No, but they, they do know, like, after the first round, they get to know if they're in the low wage rate or yes. not. And then they can decide to change the way they play. There's no more game. The, it was okay. just the one game at the beginning. I give them new money. I use that same performance, and I give them different wages. Okay. Um, in terms of agility, this is a good question. The buttons were pretty large, so we tried to make it a uh, user-friendly um, user interface. And these are right next to each other, but it's easy to put your mouse on them. I had not thought about that for a long time because I thought about it when we were designing it, but could I see it in the data? I'm not sure, it's a good question. Because you, you could see the correlation, for example, between clicks and where they perceive they are and the distribution. Yeah, we, we do have that. So I have a distribution of, um, okay, you mean in the income distribution? Yeah, yeah, after, after the game, because maybe they think that because of clicking more, yeah. they are gonna end up higher. Yeah, so um, we, where is it? I have a chart at the end on um, their, and it's in the paper, a scatter of their clicks and their click efficiency. And people were pretty good at making the relationship between um, how much they clicked and how good they were at the game. So I don't think that concern is present in our data. And the, yeah. the last one, um, if you're, Taking students from the University of Maryland in the, uh, did you say agriculture and economics department? Or um, the, the Ag Econ department hosts the lab. The people are from any department. Okay. Yeah. Be because then you kind of have some people there that actually know 
how investment works and mm -hmm. that have previous knowledge, mm -hmm. economic knowledge and terminology knowledge mm -hmm. that have kind of an advantage to some other people that don't know this terminology. And maybe yeah. with the phrasing where I think there's 20% or there's 20% people behind you or below you in the distribution, mm -hmm. this information is way easier to interpret for someone that has an e background. So we didn't tell them any percentages of, we said how many people were actually below you. And for the investment task, so we, we're asking them to uh, give a share of their, their um, pie, if you will. So we actually had a blue circle and they were to drag the line around and then it would turn red and that's the amount they wanted to give away so they could also enter it in numbers and percentages to get away from um dis different decisions among people who are probabilistically sophisticated and not um the big concern would be if the treatment causes different probabilistic sophistication but i wouldn't expect that to be the case yeah Do you want to take two questions at a time? One at a time, please. One at a time. Okay, you first. Yeah, very quick one. Um, thanks. Just to understand this uh, task again, is this the same task for everyone, or is it random how they drop down so that someone could be really lucky that it's from left to right and I only have to do three clicks and then I get all the reward and someone else has to first rush across the screen and then rush back in order to actually... Yeah, get, yeah. Um... <clears throat> That's a good question. So it's random, but I have to go back to look at the code to see exactly like did we institute the same random process, you know, with the same seed with everybody for the start so that I would have seen the same sequence of drops. I I think each ball is independent. Right? So it so people would have seen something different, but it would have been equally different within each treatment. So that's another source of variation then in terms of how efficient one was basically not yeah can't be more efficient than the right one. right right it's a good point hi uh my question is about the policy recommendations and implications yeah in the very end mm -hmm. specifically the very last bullet point in your slide or the second to last bullet mm -hmm. point it's about uh access to higher education yes i wonder why uh sorry if i put it in a true Blood of a way, but why tertiary education not before, right? I mean, because most of high uh, higher education degrees do not do not necessarily come with other modules, courses, and content. Yeah. They're necessarily built up uh, financial expertise, right? Yeah. So there is like a way to reform this and build this uh, human capital, if you like, the yeah. content or knowledge, et cetera, why not earlier in the life cycle? Um, excellent point, no reason why not. I'm conditioned. So mm -hmm. I work mostly in um, upper middle income countries and well, even even in lower income countries, the, the uh, completion rate, especially for primary education is really high. So often in policy um, implications, we're thinking about high skill development of a high skilled labor force and tertiary education. But I'm also assuming there implicitly that the primary and secondary education offerings are complete. So absolutely, though, I mean, you can't, it doesn't make sense investing a ton of money in tertiary education if you're not meeting the basic needs, right, of, of the, for human capital development in your country. So I shall change that to be more general. My, my point is rather routes for people to get into higher sociodemographic groups, again, to reduce the saliency of the rank difference. So we have a question from the online audience. Chico, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, sorry, I'm not sure I could hear. What well, is that me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Michelle, thanks. Thanks a lot for the talk. And sorry that I couldn't be, be there uh, in person. Um, my my question is uh, about mechanisms through which IOP can affect investment decisions, and uh, there were two in particular that I was thinking of, and I I wonder whether they are in your experiment or they are part of what you said is left for future research under, for example, different 
investment opportunities. So one of them, which I think many of us who thought about inequality of opportunity and investment thought about is the issue of um, non-convexities in the production set, right? So thresholds or something, i.e. the idea that um, to send your kid to a very good university may be expensive and to send your kid to a community college is less expensive and you know, you may simply not have the resources or not have access to credit to do that. In a developing country setting, it's very easy to think of families that cannot send their kids to a private school, even though they know the private school is better. So there's something about having a minimum amount required for a higher return investment or an expected higher return investment. That is, the distribution of returns of investments is different. Similarly, you know, Abhijit Banerjee has this old example of um, farmers in India who face different interest rates depending on the amount of land they have. So just the fact they have very little land already makes credit more expensive for them. Um, so one question was this, was whether the, the opportunity sets the, uh, you know, the sort of non-convexity story around, uh, around around the nature of the investment that you can or cannot afford, whether that was captured in some way, which I missed. And the other, and it may not, it may be that that's a different experiment. And the other one is issues around uh, what people call stereotype threat, mm -hmm. like Claude Steele and the sociologists, but also Carla Hoth and, and others amongst the economists, which is a more, you know, an in, in, inequality of opportunity that comes from some uh, as internal assimilation of society's prejudices against you, right? So, you know, the usual story about African-Americans uh, 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 behaving differently or lower caste people doing worse when caste in India is made salient in an experiment to them. I'm sure you know you know all of those, all, all of that literature as well. So with those two, I guess what I'm asking is whether you think your findings generalize to all kinds of contexts about inequality of opportunity, or whether you know some of these things might be missing from the experiment and you're really looking more at attitudes to risk in a sense, which I guess is is what's different here, right? I'm not sure, um, but I'll stop here. Yeah, sorry, I don't wanna cut you off. Are you done? Yes, okay. Um, thank you so much. That's a really uh, nice question. Um, I'm especially fascinated by the bringing up that you brought up the non-convexities. So our investment task does not have non-convexities. Um, it would be a different experiment, uh, but possibly really interesting. Um, if you made, for example, a menu of investment opportunities where the one with higher returns was only available once you had a certain amount of wealth, for example, um, you could then see which one people, so, so you give them both, everybody has those same options, but not everybody has the same wealth. You, then you give, uh, give them those options. Wealthy people may always choose, well, should always choose the higher one. Um, there could be some interesting uh, interactions happening there. Or you could um, play around with the wealth uh, potentially different from the circumstances, though that would get you further away from the theory. So I'm not sure I would do it that way, but it would be a different experiment. Um, stereotype threat uh, is um, something we were trying to avoid in this experiment. Um, where the way you put the question where it comes up in my mind is if people who are randomized or whose zip code were randomized to the lower earning group, then took on the identity of a lower earning person. And if everybody understands the stereotype that lower earning people are more likely to take risk um, or should catch up or whatever it is, then that would be a place where it could come in. Uh, I would have to be convinced that everybody understands that particular stereotype or that that's a common stereotype. Um, it's not one I'm aware of, so I'd have to do some, some searching to see if that's a threat to our, or not really a threat, but a nuance to how we're interpreting our results. Can I have a, just a very quick follow-up, Valentina? Yes, yes. 
So that's great. Yeah. So the non-convexity, I think you're right. I think you you could introduce it exactly in the way that you described, it. and that could be an interesting an interesting you know second experiment or something. On stereotype threat, um, I think it's not my area exactly, but I think the people in that literature feel that um, the internalization of prejudice, as it were, is a very deep, you know, lived process, which is kind of hard to randomize to people. So what they do in those experiments is they take kids of different castes, and they are already kids of different castes. They've assimilated that for, you know, the 11 years of their lives of however old they were in India when, when uh, Hoff and Pandy did that experiment. And then what they do is the treatment is they either make this caste salient by making everybody say what their caste is, or they don't. And then they see in treatment versus control how they behave. So it's mm -hmm. in that sense, I think a kind of a quite quite a different experiment. But but my point is 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 I guess um, to a little bit to be careful about generalizing your results to all aspects of inequality and opportunity. Mm -hmm. When I guess you know, you're looking at some, but there are others which may be in the world, which, which are, are somehow, you know, for, for very, for, for very good reasons, uh, you can't capture everything, but they may not be, be present in your, in your experience. Yeah. And Thanks actually, so, so the, the zip code, we do ask them their zip code, right? So they report it and you could be triggering some stereotype threat response there. And I did look, I have looked at whether there's differential response by um, to meet the average uh, zip code, uh, sorry, the average income by zip code. I don't find result there. So it doesn't appear that people are responding to their own zip code elicitation for this treatment effect. Any more questions from the audience? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for a really interesting presentation. And uh, I had a couple of questions that maybe for my own understanding. Um, when you were talking at the start about the the possible like theoretical role of um, subjective assessments of uh, of return on investment through uh, greater pessimism, this, and then I saw that in the experiment the um, the the kind of figures were laid out fairly clearly to the participants. I was just wondering, doesn't that kind of eliminate the subjective role of how people are yes. forecasting that? Yes. So we wanted to uh, separate out the effect of your actual experiences uh, from what's going on in the laboratory because we wanted to randomize your inequality of opportunity. If I kept in elements that would really trigger your experiences, I can't randomize that as effectively. So in the lab, I'm trying to control for as many things as possible that could have simultaneity or uh, omitted variable bias in the, the studies that I put up there, like uh, pessimistic expectations. So I assume I'm not going to get what they say I might get. Yes. Okay. And so I'm saying, no, 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 everything about the outcome is going to be equal for you. So let's, I wanted to get away from like spite reactions or um, uh, fear reactions or like any of these emotional things that we, that, that we experience when we're faced with something that looks quintessentially unfair, uh, except for I just wanted to be able to control their exposure to this unfair than wage. I wanted that to be the one source of uh, the unfairness. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you. And um, and on the kind of uh, the other variables that uh, play a role, um, did did meritocratic beliefs have any impact on, for example, how people responded to the treatments? Because I was I was seeing the the explanation about kind of trying to standardize the interpretation. Yeah. And, Postcodes, and I was just yeah. thinking people might have very different responses to that. So we do ask in our post-experiment survey um, what people think is important for effort. We ask them about values that you would teach your children. And we ask them about their expectations for winning in different circumstances. Like when it's random, I should win as much as everyone else. Or when it's hard work, I should win if I put in the effort. You know, these types of questions. Uh, we, there doesn't seem to be any heterogeneous effects 
along those dimensions. Um, we didn't power the experiments to test that per se, those heterogeneities. So we could be underpowered for some of that stuff, but I don't find in our in my most kind of um, aggregate uh, place, so where I can use all the data and I'm not slicing it five ways, if I just regress um, the investment choices on inequality of opportunity compared to control and interacted with a binary variable that captures merit meritocratic beliefs or what have you, it does not seem to um, be a meaningful source of heterogeneity. Uh, this is surprising to me. Um, that one issue with that is that there's not a ton of variation in like a lot of people uh, think that effort matters, right? Very few people would say luck's the only thing that matters. Um, so um, I think to really understand how those beliefs may be playing a role here, we would need to implement in other places where people don't have as strong beliefs about meritocracy. I mean, in the US, it's like a cultural, it's an identity to say like, if you work hard, you get, if you don't work hard, you don't get. And if you haven't gotten, you haven't worked hard, right? Like we're really ingrained with that growing up. So it's, so it's maybe not the most informative sample to answer that specific question. Great, thanks. So I also have a question, and I think it's the last one. Uh, um, so what about feeling like I have little to lose after I have already had like one, I mean, the zip code is, is a real thing, right? It's external validity, but at the same time, it might feel for them a little bit random that they got the lower wage rate. So there was already some luck involved. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like being at the casino, I lost, I'm gonna try again. Mm -hmm. really sorry. Yeah. And for the people who are in the high uh, paying rate, mm -hmm. like, okay, I went to the casino, I won, I don't want to lose my money, so I don't keep playing. Right? Yeah. So I don't think that's going on simply because um, we don't see that happen in the, IOP with no rank information. But they, they don't know that they lost. They do. They know that they had the lower wage rate. And they, they, right? So they already know they got randomized into the low wage rate. So that's the loss mm -hmm. I lost that you're talking about, right? Yeah. So I lost that, I, that zip code lottery. Now I'm just going to throw it all in and so we we don't see that in that group. It's, it really hinges on knowing where you are in that um, in that distribution. Now it could be that some of that nothing to lose feeling fuels the consumption externalities, um, but but it's certainly um, it would so one would have to really drill down more into that to see how meaningful that is, but we don't see it when you simply lose the zip code lottery, it doesn't seem to impact your willingness to invest. Okay, so I think that that would be it. Um, thank you very much for, for joining this seminar. And uh, I guess we have a seminar next week, right? <laughs> oh yeah, you're invited to join the seminar next week. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody.